we've managed to get some good things in relation to the work-wise, relation to some of our numbers and crime, but our members are tired. Uh, our front lines are tired. I've been going out to parades, you know, and certainly we used to take and work Wednesdays in the divisions, and, you know, they're just tired because it hasn't been the most positive environment. So Edmonton's total crime rate decreased by 17% between 2018 and 2020. You're familiar with Vision 2020 when we pivoted and changed our service delivery model. Well, that's right here. And so what that says is we went down 17%, Alberta went down 7%, and Canada went down 4%. So we're, we're starting to close the gap. <clears throat> now, as you and I have talked about before, Edmonton has had a crime rate that's been in the top two or three for similar sized cities forever, 20 some years. These are starting to see progress and some of the adjustments we've made are actually starting to take effect. Now, you'll also know this because I think we've talked about this with all members of the media, <coughs> severity of crime. So for instance, a thing like a murder or attempt murder scores higher than say a criminal harassment or a forcible confinement. The reason for that is to make sure when you're comparing jurisdictions is it's apples to apples when it talks to serious crime that everything goes through a metrics and a scale. So let's say a homicide doesn't skew your stats but at the same time it's counted as more than a normal uh, use of force or, or particular violent offense. <coughs> Edmonton's property crime rate decreased by 12% between 2018 and 2020. <clears throat> That's where we pivoted. So up until this point, and, and I think I've talked about this before, as we measured eight key crime indicators, and of those eight key crime indicators, property crime was kind of forgotten. So property crime, things that were out of control, compounds, catalytic converters is a different one, putting some of these things and attention back into this, because they're all prerequisite for crimes, a lot of these. <coughs> started to drop. So we went down 12%, Alberta went down 8%, Canada went down 8%. We're starting to close the gap on property. In relation to crime severity, <clears throat> so total crime severity decreased by 11% between 18 and 2020. So we went down 11%, again, check out the point here. Alberta went down 6%, Canada went down 4%. Again, crime severity, so the more serious stuff, we're still closing the gap. <coughs> And then, of course, if we get to the next one, nonviolent crime severity decreased by 15% between 18 and 20. Again, you can see the pivot point. We went down 15, Alberta went down 9, Canada went down 7%. But this is, the, this is one that's really interesting to end with. <clears throat> Edmonton's violent crime rate decreased by 6% between 18 and 20. So we went down, or Alberta went up 7%, Canada went up 9%, and we went down 6%. So the first time in at least 10 years, we think probably 20, and we don't know, it could be forever, but we're not, we can't say that for sure, but at least 10 years, for the first time, our violent rate has decreased below the Canadian average. So this shows that some of those things that we've pivoted for are actually starting to make a difference. Now, was that easily bought into when we made this decision pre-COVID, pre-George Floyd, 2019? No, it took a lot of convincing, but now we're starting to see some of these things become the way we do business, working on both sides, not, not hard on crime, arrest and incarcerate, not soft on crime, hugs and second chances, lack of better words, smart on community safety and well-being. That's how we're trying to make our decisions, and that's why we're trying to ensure with our value impact stream that we have that we're measuring everything till we see that we're having an impact. We have two things. We have people and we have resources, people and money. And we need to ensure that we're using those to leverage with our partnerships to get results.